Okay. 703. People are still coming in, but I can slow start the ball rolling. Hi, everyone. I'm Eric Shoemaker. I'm a board member at Louisville Literary Arts, and welcome to Inky. Inky May. Inky May, the end of the season until fall. We've got a really stellar lineup here. Angela, Lisa, and Megan are going to blow our socks off, and it's going to be a great time. Um, just a reminder to uh, maintain your Zoom etiquette. Um, mute yourself, and um, you can unmute to applaud and ask questions, but otherwise, please keep the noise to a minimum. And also, feel free to turn on your video so we can see your shining faces and your reactions. Um, that really helps poets and writers feel like there are people like with them in the writing. So um, feel free to do that. And um, I just wanted to quickly shout out Amy Miller, who is behind the scenes right now, operating tech for us. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, and uh, plug a couple of upcoming LLA events for you. Um, I'm going to put in the chat a little link to our webinar descriptions. Um, so we have a couple of really great ones coming up. Um, May 15th, which is this Saturday, uh, Being with Plants, Breath Collaboration and Poetry with Megan Kaminsky, who will be reading tonight. Um, this is gonna be an eco workshop of sorts, uh, talking about breath, contemplation, poetry. Um, and I'm really excited about it. So um, hopefully y'all are too. Um, we have uh, our writers meet up on May 19th at 7 p.m. That is free. And we have dialogue, speaking life into your characters with Angela Jackson Brown, who is also here with us. And that also sounds really exciting because I too want to write dialogue that makes people cry, um, which is in our description. If you haven't read it, A plus. Um, and uh, so that's a fiction workshop. Please, please come to that. Um, and um, also, we are currently on the hunt for board members. So if anybody's interested in being on LLA's board, um, go ahead and check out our website. You can contact Irv Klein, who's the board president. All right. Are we ready to begin? We're very excited. Um, so our first reading um, is going to be from Lisa Dordal. I should say that at the very end of all the readings, we'll have some time for Q&A. So if you come up with any burning questions that you want to ask, go ahead and jot those down as we go through so that you remember it by the end. Um, and then we'll kick it off with Lisa. So Lisa Dordal teaches in the English department at Vanderbilt University and is the author of Mosaic of the Dark, which was a finalist for the 2019 Audre Lorde Award for Lesbian Poetry and Water Lessons, which is forthcoming. She's a Pushcart Prize and Best of the Net nominee and the recipient of an Academy of American Poets University Prize and the Robert Watson Poetry Prize. Her poetry has appeared in Narrative, Rhino, The New Ohio Review, Best New Poets, Ninth Letter, Calyx, and The Sun. And I'll put a link to Lisa's website in the chat. Lisa, take it away. Great. Thank you, Eric. And thank you both to Amy and Eric for hosting this event. I'm thrilled to be here and to be sharing the, the Zoom stage with Megan and Angela. Um, so I'm going to actually start with a poem from Mosaic of the Dark, which came out in 2018. Um, from Black Lawrence Press. And then the other poems are, I'm going to read are from Water Lessons, which is forthcoming. So about 12, 13 years ago, I became reconnected with someone I went to grammar school with. And as soon as I found out he was gay, I knew I had to write this poem. This is called Sixth Grade. Under a warm June sun during the break between social studies and language arts, they married us off. Our bodies surrounded on the cracked pavement of our schoolyard by friends, classmates, then by something larger, sovereign and invisible. Bruce in wide jeans, a pink Oxford button down, and brown tie-ups so shiny you could see birds in the patches of sky they reflected 
everything about him beautiful. Me in a short purple dress and soda orange sneakers that the older sister of my best friend told me had to go. A boy named Peter officiated, spoke the words that blended us together. The same boy who told me there were two types of women, that I was the kind men married, not the kind men used for practicing what they never wanted to perfect. Even in the race sore 70s on Chicago's South Side, no one minded this one rupture, this one tear in the taut dictates of order that he was black and I was white, but they wouldn't tolerate our queerness, the clang of missed baskets, other kids shooting hoops was our music, that and the cursing that always followed. Uh, and I should say we, we got divorced three days later. Um, and, and one of my favorite memories from that whole experience is that one of my, one of my friends in my circle actually made a toaster for us out of a shoebox with um, buttered bread, buttered toast that she had made out of construction paper. So that's um, a little taste of Mosaic of the Dark. And now I want to read from Water Lessons, which, as I said, is coming out in 2022. Um, for those, of, for any of you who have read Mosaic of the Dark, you will see that my obsession with my mother who died in 2001 is still growing strong <laughs> in, in this newest book. This poem is called, My Mother is a Peaceful Ghost. In my dreams, my mother keeps walking out of the kitchen singing, you are my sunshine, my only sunshine. She never sings past the first verse. Last night, I dreamed I was back at the house, every light on when I arrived. My mother, forgetting she was dead, smiled, said she was fine, everything was fine. At family gatherings, weddings, baptisms, my mother would look around sort of stunned and say, there's so many of you as if we'd arrived from someplace other than her own body, a country foreign to her. My mother is no longer flesh or breath. She's not a thing anymore. Is she with God? Some days I believe, some days I don't. Centuries ago in a church in Europe, someone carved God help us into a pew, plague years. Sometimes my God is so big, I wonder what's the use, divinity diluted into nothingness. My mother tried to stop drinking. I stopped, she told me once, like you'd stop a dryer or a washing machine. We were standing in the Black Waterfalls gift shop, looking at coffee mugs printed with maps. West Virginia on one side, waterfalls on the other. One mug had a gold star to mark the visitor center. You are here, it said, on a travel mug. Here and not here. How do you name what isn't here? She tried to stop and didn't. So I know that, that several of you here know um, are familiar with the AWP conference that happens every year. But for those of you who aren't, it is a huge writing conference that attracts something like 10,000 people each year when we're not in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and I, I love the conference, but I also find it very overwhelming. And so my strategy is to go to as many panels during the day as I can, and then go back to the hotel room and just in the evening and just watch TV and flip channels to sort of decompress. And back in 2017, the conference was in DC and I was staying at a hotel that had one of those welcome channels on the TV that someone would come on and talk about the amenities of, of the hotel. And as you will see, I got a little freaked out by the welcome channel. Welcome. Flipping the remote, I keep landing on the hotel's welcome channel. Hello, a woman says, 
white woman, pretty smile, may I have a minute of your time? Be as alert as you are at home, she says, pretty woman, concerned for my safety. She keeps walking towards me there behind everything else, like fear behind the eyes. I keep flipping, taking in the news of the week. People are protesting in the streets. This pussy fights back, no ban, no wall. Never invite strangers into your room. Pretty smile, pretty woman, as pretty as my mother was when she was alive, pretty as she was in my dream. Be alert, the woman says, as alert as you are at home. I never knew on Tuesdays what she'd look like. My mother, who drove to the Del Mar College of Hair Design to get dolled up cheap by a stranger, sometimes large loopy curls, other times tight and small, tucked in like something sleeping. Use the viewport, the woman says, if someone knocks on your door. Hepburn chestnut one week to a sassy blonde the next. In the dream, she is reading from my book. She looks happy. Keep the doors and windows locked, the woman says. In five pages, my mother will be dead. First, the bottles hidden in bookcases throughout the house. Then the heart wing locked, the woman says, at all times. My mother glances up. She is reading in the voice she used for Sounder and the Chronicles of Narnia. She reads as if the woman she is will not die, as if the woman who dies will not be her, as if she is not even there. Like when she learned about my attempts, aspirin, then the knife, my hand like Abraham's over Isaac. Nice story, my mother said. We had learned to slip out of ourselves, to squeeze our consciousness through a hole the size of a dime. We were small inside our bodies. My body is thin, she told me once. Be alert, the woman says, as alert as you are at home. Nice story, she said. Um, so another topic that I explore in Water Lessons is childlessness. And this poem is called Daughter Poem. Sometimes I see her pressing her palms against a window pane in a house that is real, the way a house in a dream is real, until you start to describe it and all you can say is, it was this house, only it wasn't. It's winter and she likes to feel the cold entering her body, or it's summer and it's heat she's after. She wasn't born so she can't die. Sometimes there is a window, but no girl, and I am the one walking towards it. Sometimes I see her peering in, forehead against the screen of our back door, or running ahead of me on a path that is real, the way a path in a dream is real, saying, this way, this way. And then another topic that I explore in Water Lessons is dementia, because my father has dementia. Uh, and this poem is called Dementia Bus. The glasses they give me darken my vision, blur it into shapes I can't immediately recognize. I'm supposed to set the table for breakfast, write a check for the electric bill, put on the brown jacket, not the blue jacket, and sort the shirts in the laundry basket, long sleeved from short. Every noun preceded by the, as if I live here, comfortably surrounded by my life's possessions. I'm wearing oversized gloves to mimic arthritis, spiky insoles for neuropathy. I hear voices simultaneously loud and muffled through headphones that press heavily against my ears. A few times laughter that stops too suddenly and a siren so loud I jump uttering, get me out of here. To myself, I think, except there's a woman in the corner watching me. She's taking notes, 
she's too quiet. When I leave wearing the blue jacket, not the brown jacket, she gives me her notes in which my failures are recorded along with my words. My father keeps merging houses, first wife and seconds. He knows me, he doesn't know me. Sometimes he looks into my face as if he's looking into a room darkened by night. When he was a boy, he had to walk all the way through his bedroom to reach the room's only light switch. I don't know if it's fear he feels now. He thinks the house he lives in has two piano rooms. And when I visit, he sees birds in the windows of my car. I see leaves reflected and branches, not birds. Don't you see them, he asks. I'm not supposed to disagree, don't you? Sometimes he gives me clues from the crossword puzzle. Here's one for you, he says. Part of LGBT, three letters starting with G. He's proud I came out. Some days he thinks he's on a ship. Some days he thinks he has patients to see, meetings to attend. Some days he sees birds in the windows of my car. When I drive back home, I take the birds with me. And then I'm going to close with a, a, a longer poem that addresses lots of different issues. This one is called The Life I Live. I could feel them looking up at me, imaginary customers in a lightly furnished room. As I scribbled orders on a small pad of paper, I was nine bringing make-believe food to people in a hurry or on vacation. One I remember was grieving, another I could tell was in love. Sometimes I imagine myself at 90 somewhere north forever cold, cradling a doll, my mind as demented as my father's is now, the doll's eyes opening and closing, making a soft clicking sound, like an upturned beetle trying to right itself. My daughter, neither born nor conceived, splits my life in two directions. I like my life, who I've become and who I love, Still, my mind bears a creek deep enough for swimming, children's shoes piling up by the back door. My sorrow is as real as I am. Sometimes I barely feel it, the way an animal hibernating in winter might be cut and barely bleed. Other times, the daughter I never had cups her hands around fireflies a glass jar on the grass beside her and asks, why doesn't night stay in the jar? Joanna Macy says we must face our despair, look right at it, which is why I looked at George, Hawaiian tree snail, last of his kind, dead the first of the year. His death symbolic as it was real. When you give something a name, People pay attention, and everyone said he must have been lonely. Here's something I can't name, the peace I felt while looking at his photo, as if looking was a kind of love, not enough, but more than nothing at all. My daughter is a lovely fiction, and God, what shall I do with God? A priest held hostage for three years, celebrated communion every day with his fellow prisoners, body of Christ broken for you as he distributed the invisible bread, blood of Christ shed for you, pretending to lift a chalice of wine. Everyone said what happened was real. My sorrow twists dolls out of willow, buries them in the shade of an old tree. My daughter presses her hands over my eyes. Now you see me, now you don't. The doll's eyes open and close. I'm happier than this poem says I am, and also sadder. Maybe this will be enough at 90, walking through snow, holding 
what isn't there until what isn't there calls my name. That's it. Thank you so much, Lisa. Feel free to unmute and applaud or put your applause in the chat. <laughs> Thank you. It was really beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next, we have Angela. Angela Jackson Brown is an award winning writer, poet, and playwright who teaches creative writing and English at Ball State University. She's the author of the novel Drinking from a Bitter Cup and has published in numerous literary <laughs> journals. Her book of poetry called House Repairs was published by Negative Capability Press in the fall of 2018. And in the fall of 2019, she directed and produced a play she wrote called Still Singing Those Weary Blues. Her new novel, When Stars Rain Down, was recently published by Thomas Nelson, imprint of HarperCollins, and the Alabama Library Association recently awarded her the Alabama Authors Award in Poetry. I'll put Angela's website in the chat and Angela, take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. And thank you uh, to everyone uh, at Inky, my husband and I. Uh, thank you, Amy. I was thinking about when I've done this a few times with Inky, and we were trying to think when was the last time, the last, the, the first time you all were at the Rudyard Kipling, which tells you how very long ago it was when I first read uh, with Inky. So it's exciting to be back, even though I can't be in the room with all of you. It's nice at least to see your faces and see your names. So tonight I'm going to read to you from my new book, When Stars Rain Down. Usually I pick a sad uh, part of the book to focus on, but I thought, you know what, there is happiness in this book. So why don't you share some of the happiness? So tonight I'm gonna to read a chapter where we get to see the main character, Opal Pruitt, um, have the first courting session with her boyfriend, uh, her soon to be boyfriend, Cedric. The book is set in 1936 in a fictional town in Georgia called Parsons, Georgia. Uh, but all the Black people there live in a part of, of Parsons that they call Colored Town. Make sure I've got my clock going. When Cedric knocked on the door about 30 minutes after Granny and I got through eating supper, Granny pulled me close and whispered in my ear, you might be old enough to keep company but I ain't gonna have you sitting out there with some boy without me keeping my eyes and ears open. I don't care if he is the preacher's son. I'll be just inside the door reading my Bible. That's fine, Granny, I said. I wasn't gonna complain about Granny staying close by while I visited with Cedric. If the truth be known, I was a bit nervous about being alone with him or any boy for that matter. Other than my boy cousins and my uncles and Jimmy Earl, I hadn't spent a lot of time around boys. Granny didn't allow it, and I wasn't comfortable with it. The first time Cedric and I had been alone together was the other day, and it was by accident. This was for real. This was a boy coming courting, and I felt unsure about everything. I wished I'd had time to talk to Lucille about it. Even though I was a tad bit older than her, she was far more knowledgeable about everything concerning boys. She wasn't a fast girl, but she watched and she experimented with flirting. And I, on the other hand, didn't know the first thing about being a flirt with a boy. I hope I didn't make a fool out of myself. I started towards the door, but Granny stopped me. Don't ever let a boy see you too eager. Be patient. Boys will respect you for that, Granny said down low. I thought about Hazel Moody. She seemed pretty fast to me with her makeup and quick words, and the boys seemed to love her, but I didn't say that out loud. I knew Granny would have had something to say. Every time she saw Hazel Moody, her lips turned down in disapproval. I watched as she went to the door. I stood behind her just out of eye shot. 
How are you doing, Cedric, she asked. Her voice was not warm as it normally is when company comes calling. I guess considering this was the first boy to ever come courting me, her dryness was understandable. Good evening, Miss Birdie, he said. I waited for a moment and then I walked out. Cedric immediately began to smile. Hi, Opal. I still couldn't get over how pretty his smile was. It almost didn't feel right for a boy to have such a pretty smile. I could hardly speak. I was so busy staring. Granny poked me in my ribs. Hi, Cedric, I said, my voice sounding hoarse. I was ashamed I'd been caught gazing at him like that. Didn't seem to bother Cedric because he smiled even bigger. I couldn't resist his smile, so I smiled back. I realized then that I was completely and totally smitten with Cedric Perkins. I knew me and Lucille were going to have hours to talk about. I noticed that he'd gone home and cleaned up after work. He looked so handsome in his clean pair of jeans and white shirt. I was happy I'd put on a fresh dress and fixed my hair. I still had bruises on my face, but they weren't as bad as they had been. My dark skin didn't allow for the bruises to stand out as much as if my skin was light, like Granny's and Luc or Lucille's. So that was another reason for me to love my dark skin. Granny finally cleared her throat. Y'all children can sit out on the porch for a while. It's cooler out here than it is inside. Have you eaten supper yet, Cedric? Yes, ma'am. Mama had supper cooked when I got done in the fields. So I ate before I left, he said. I had never heard Cedric sound so proper. He sounded exactly like the kind of boy Granny had been praying for. Well, that's good, Granny said. You tell brother and sister Perkins I said hello when you get home. I'll leave you children to visit for a while. I'll be right in there with my Bible. True to her word, Granny sat in a chair, pulled up close to the door. Thank you, Granny, I said. I allowed myself to be guided, guided outside by Cedric, his hand barely touching the small of my back. We went over to the port swing and Cedric started to gently swing us. For a moment, we didn't say anything. He just took my hand in his and we enjoyed each other's company. The swinging created a breeze. It was still powerfully hot outside, but I barely felt it. Finally, I could take the silence no more. Did you have a good day? He shrugged, it was okay. I spent most of my time making sure the farm animals didn't get too thirsty. I don't think we're gonna have a crop this year if this drought don't let up. I nodded and then added, I was listening to Lou Zeller earlier today on the radio. He said he didn't think we, things would get better anytime soon. I felt silly talking about the weather, but I didn't know what else to talk about. I had never talked to a boy like this before. I had known Cedric my entire life, but he and I had never talked. I worried that my inability to flirt like Lucille and womanliness like Hazel would cause Cedric to get bored with me. He's probably right. There ain't been a hint of rain for weeks. Something's got to give soon or we'll be in a mess of hurt with the crops and the animals, he said. Then he paused and caressed my hand. Somehow Cedric sure knew what to do to nearly about make my heart stop. All of this kissing and caressing felt good, but it also felt scary. I looked over towards the door to make sure Granny wasn't staring at us, but her eyes were in her Bible. I was grateful for that. I should have pulled my hand away, but I liked how it felt when he touched me. I looked at him and he was gazing at me with what looked like concern. You look like you feel a bit better than you did this morning. Do you, he asked. I ducked my head. Yes, I know I was looking a mess. I felt embarrassed that I had sat there in front of Cedric this morning with my robe and my hair going every which way. Hazel Moody never would have let herself be seen in such an unkept way. He tilted my chin up so I was looking at him. That's not what I meant. You always look amazing to me, Opal. I love everything about you, your eyes, your skin, your hair, everything. I'm so glad you aren't one of those girls who packs on the makeup. You don't need anything extra to make you look beautiful. I smiled at him. His words almost left me speechless. Finally, I found my manners and spoke. Thank you. You're quite handsome yourself. 
I felt strange saying it, but it was true. Cedric Perkins was the handsomest boy I had ever seen, period. Before I knew what was happening, Cedric leaned in and kissed me. Do you know when folks say they saw stars when someone kissed them and it always sounded silly or downright crazy? Well, I promise you, when Cedric kissed me, it was like the heavens opened up and all the stars rained down from the sky. I heard Granny clear her throat from the door. I didn't care. This was my second kiss from Cedric, and I wasn't going to let Granny's hovering ruin it. The first kiss caught me off guard. This kiss was like magic. Cedric pulled away and stared at me with an emotion that I was not accustomed to seeing. Was it desire? Was it attraction? Surely it wasn't love. I know in the books and movies that Lucille likes, love happens fast, but I didn't really think that was real. Surely people don't do that in real life. I am not the man I plan to be, Opal. I know I got a lot of work to do to become who you deserve, but eventually I will be, and I hope you'll wait for me, Cedric said, stroking my cheek with the knuckles of his hand. Before I could answer, Granny stepped out on the porch. Would you children like some lemonade, she said. Cedric looked up and had the good graces to look embarrassed. Thank you, ma'am. That would be nice, he said. Opal, come help me with the lemonade. I didn't really want to get up, but I could tell by Granny's expression that I better. I followed her into the kitchen. Don't you go moving too fast with this boy, she said. Boys and men don't have the sense to know when their nature is leading them in the wrong direction. It's up to the girl to be the voice of reason and say stop when stop needs to be said. Yes, ma'am, I said. I prayed Cedric couldn't hear us talking. I should have said that to your mama. It was my fault for thinking she knew better when clearly she didn't, Granny said. I ain't my mama, I said, taking the picture from Granny and pouring the lemonade into the two glasses. We didn't have a fancy refrigerator like Miss Peggy, just a cooling box with some ice. There was an ice shortage due to the drought and the extreme heat. I hoped I hoped the lukewarm lemonade would taste all right. Can I go back outside? Yes, Granny said. Opal, I know you ain't Maybell but you're young and I don't want you to do anything you'll regret. Cedric is a good person. I like him and he likes me, but I got good sense, Granny. I would never do anything to embarrass you or the family. I picked up the glasses of lemonade and walked back out to the porch, only to find my cousin MJ sitting in one of the porch swings. Hey, MJ, MJ, I said. I gave Cedric his glass of lemonade and gave MJ the one I had poured for myself. Thanks, cousin MJ, said Granny. He knew I wasn't happy to see him. I thought I would come and keep y'all company. You shouldn't have, Cedric said, but he had a huge smile on his face. How you feeling, cousin MJ asked, suddenly getting very serious. I heard I'm fine, I said quickly. MJ nodded. Well, glad you're okay. Go tell your granny, I'll make sure you kids don't get out of hand. I went inside to get myself a glass of lemonade and granny was sitting back in her rocker with her Bible on her lap. MJ is outside, I said. I heard him, she said. I looked to see if she was smiling, but she kept flipping through the pages of her Bible. I guess my courting was over for the night. I went over to the cooling box and took out the lemonade and poured myself a glass. When I got back outside, I knew for certain it was over. MJ and Cedric were deep in conversation about baseball, their favorite topic. They say old Satch is gonna pitch for the McDonough Brown Thrashers this Saturday, MJ said, the excitement clear in his voice. As I sat beside Cedric, it was clear he was excited too. You lying, Cedric said. I didn't even know that was for certain. Watch y'all's tongues, Granny called out. 
Yes, ma'am, Cedric said. Oh, man, nothing is ever certain with Satchel Page, but that's what everybody's saying. I heard the owner of the Brown Thrashers paid Satch a pretty penny to come and pitch a few innings. You know, Satch ain't going to pitch more than a few innings. He old as dirt, Cedric said, laughing. It's amazing a man his age can still throw a ball. He ain't that old, just in his 30s. But I did hear his arm ain't always consistent. Some folks say he ain't got much left. Cedric turned towards me and whispered, you think your granny will let me take you to the game? I shook my head. Not likely. Granny doesn't like ball games and she doesn't think it's fitting for young girls to attend. It's a miracle she allowed you to come over here. MJ got up from his seat on the steps. Leave it to me. We all know I'm Granny's favorite. I'll get her to let you go. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. That's amazing. It's... <laughs> I share Irv's sentiment that I could see them. It was, it really like lit up. It was very compelling. Thank you so much. All right, our last reader for tonight is Megan Kaminsky. Megan Kaminsky is a poet and essayist and the author of three books of poetry, Gentle Women with Noemi Press, Deep City, also Noemi Press, and Desiring Map with Coconut Books. Prairie Divination, her forthcoming illustrated collection of essays and oracle deck with artist L. Ann Wheeler, turns to the plants, animals, and geological features of the prairie ecosystem as guides for living in good relation to each other. An associate professor in English and co-director of the Global Grasslands Collaborative at the University of Kansas, she specializes in poetry and poetics, plant studies, queer ecology, somatics, eco-arts practices, and the environmental humanities. Megan, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, and thank you, Amy, for hosting, and thank you, Angela and Lisa, for such beautiful readings. It's just a real honor to read with the two of you and to be here virtually with Inky, which is, I just love your reading series. I had so much fun last time I was here reading with TJ Jarrett, so it's, it's nice to be back through the computer. Um, all right, this is a new one. Under Tree Canopy. By oak leaf hydrangea sipping creekside, watching fat bumblebees drunk and stumbling. In shade, in shelter, our smallness grows into something strong, no longer afraid to take up space or yield to powdery blossom. Peonies, dogwood, and shining blue star, gentle teachers of sweetness, of stopping to breathe and stop soft touch. Maybe it's true that we are all alone together, able to imagine a variety of sadnesses other than our own, and in that seeing our chance to open, to face the sun. Young robins chatter incessant, and willow leaves curl waxy green in fingers, providing company and counsel. How to fall over again and again and keep going. How easy to linger in the wayside, sit by the water and allow each verdant brush to transform seed into wily seedling, bud to pink flower. How to realize each expectant whisper in our own heart. So for the reading today, I decided to do a reading. So I did a reading for the reading um, using the Prairie Divination deck that I'm working on um, with Leslie Ann Wheeler. Um, so I have, I have a prototype. Um, and the card I pulled for the reading today was, I don't know if you can see, there you go, the Yucca card. Um, and if you see at the bottom, um, the the value we assign to it is industry. So the Prairie Divination deck is a oracle deck that's designed to help people connect to the tall grass prairie ecosystem as a source for wisdom of how we might live 
in better relation with each other, um, including more than human persons in the world, um, and to counter extractive and exploitative relationships. So we look to different plants and animals um, of the tall grass prairie for sources of wisdom. And the yucca card and the yucca plant is guiding my reading today um, from gentle women. But I will start by reading my little essay on the yucca plant. Um, one of the few plants to remain green all year, yucca has thick and heavy leaves that are shaped like swords. Their extensive root systems with many horizontal roots, as well as a sturdy taproot, provide them with sustenance in times of plentiful rain and in times of drought. Yucca is a member of the Gave family, whose members are typically from tropical or very dry hot areas and as a result might seem like an unusual native plant for the Midwest and Plains. Yucca is a plant used with many uses. Its sharp points and fibers were used as needles and thread, leaves and fibers used in basket making, flower stalks were eaten, roots and waxy leaves provided soap. Moreover, yuccas provide nesting materials and structures for native bees who often build their nests beneath, within, or harvest parts to construct their nests. Yucca also has an obligate symbiotic relationship with the yucca moth that has sustained both species for millions of years. When the yucca plant comes into your life, you're being asked to think about industry and resources. Look around you and discover opportunities for mutual aid with your neighbors, friends, and colleagues both of the human and more than human variety. The yucca plant teaches us that we are stronger when we collaborate. Our interconnectedness and interdependence are the source of strength and sustenance. Now is the time to connect with others. What do you have to offer? What do you need? If you have ongoing relationships, now is the time to check in. If you've been going it alone, now is the time to reach out and make connections. So I selected poems from Gentle Women um, using the yucca as my guide. And Gentle Women is very much a book about relationships, um, relationships between sisters, real and imagined, um, and also relationship um, between, between people and the, the you know, the people who are, who are other than human. So I'm going to read um, a, few sec a few poems from the middle section of the book, which is through the voice of Providence, um, the allegorical figure, and then a few um, from Dear Sister, um, which is another kind of imagined sisterly relationship. Instructions, how to hold the world. To a compass and hold and make home. To allow and pass and all to pass through boundaries. The porous body of we and I and they and so. To contain, to let wander, to give and give and. To filter through flesh, through soil, through layers of lung and bedrock. To siphon off downstream, off diesel tank, off currency flow, to misplace capital, to change and let change, tissue yielding to branch, bone to blossom, each cavern a hive, a swarming into body, into sound, into dark thump, to fortify, to merit want and waiting, to carry one heart and another and another, hidden from the world through multiple exposures, layered film frame on body, on open field, on landfill. To give yourself until there is nothing left, to be broken into so many pieces, the only option to piece something new, to open to dust. There is nothing and everything, and perhaps no you anymore. I am bell and ghost. 
throwing dice, quietly watching hand bleed to sky to crow puff and contract. In the cold, we are all alone together, sipping coffee while staring at screens, out window into city streets, storm runoff coursing into drains, skin cells peppering the ground, seeding might be and could happen, other ghosts to populate late night walks, confessions of love and other things DM'd, hands reaching across quarantine zones, feet shuffling through empty halls. I am shadow and siren, stacking receipts in the sun, panently wishing for neighbors to move from house and also from this wintering of trees and birds. Bells toll on the hill, mark the end of morning and quiet and all that is still in my brain. The day sent packing, trudging through commercial district and over field, spreading statistical analysis of CO2 and architectural rendings. The floors creak, the walls shake, and relations branch phylogenetic. The shift clock sounds day is here, and here, and here. I am bird chirp and scabbed knee. Tree budding pink, sending shadow across the lawn. Murmur into quiet to construction rattle along the edges of hills. I am trade wind and lost hours and nose nudge under collar, pleading for a little taste, a better scent to tuck in my pocket, to gather in my store for keeping safe. And where the day takes you, I will follow. And when the sun settles deep in weeds, I will be commodity field grains silently calling. I am stone and stone, becoming blood and bone dissolved in soil and river carving plateau, coal scar of hill and valley, neither deep nor high. And I am hot call and sweet whistle, tornado siren sounding answer, wetlands drained for subdivision and cow grazing hillside and branch decaying by the river and the tick that lives below, below that log where we rest on hikes. All right, and I'm gonna finish up by reading from um, the poem, it's a long poem, but I'm just gonna read little bits of it. Um, Dear Sister into Shadow. And I've been, a, I was estranged from my sister um, for probably the last about 10 years and um, was writing this poem, I think really wanting to reconnect. I mean, the book is about sisters and I didn't think I was writing about my sister, but I think I was writing about my relationship with her. Um, and we actually reconnected uh, during the pandemic as this book was um, going through the final publishing process. And I'm flying to see her um, next month. So I don't know what that has to, that part doesn't have anything to do with the poem, but um, this is the poem, Dear Sister. Um, she put her ear to the earth. She put her ear to the earth and listened. She put her ear to the earth and listened to what was below. She listened for she who could not listen, she who had stopped listening long before. She listened for a heart that echoed into concrete and sod and subcutaneous rock and water tables and pipelines and permafrost and petrified bone, forgotten bodies and microbes teeming. She listened for her sister whose heart had been swallowed she listened for her sister whose eyes had been stolen. She listened for her sister who listened and listened with only the vibration of footfall on earth above, earth below. She listened for the dark parts, the voices she kept hidden in herself bodied in cold storage, but she is because she is, and her sister is the call into stone as well is broken and bare and burning the fields, 
scorching ground, seeding for spring deep rooted into prairie. Is meadowlark and sandpiper and white footed mouse and blue stem and switchgrass. And into gray daybreak, a shuffle of letters and poems and photos. Across continent, a sister passes into darkness, collective echo. When the wind comes, you inhale it whole. And ocean and snow accumulate on cold and hot ground, dirt wet near the coast, bedrock sighing, weighting the weight of bodies, exhale of expectations. So in the part that I'm not reading, um, this is also about Inanna. This is Sumerian myth. And the sister, the speaker, travels into the underworld um, to meet her sister, and she dies and then is brought back to life. And um, this is, that's happened. Um, <laughs> we're coming back in. She's, she's, she's re-entering the world. So she rose to the day, calling sunlight seeped into crevice, cracking blinded through panels. She rose the morning and the sticky feeling in her throat that might release but chose not to. She rose to light. She rose to darkness. She rose to the gentle rain on the roof, sump pumping, churning water into sidewalks, into street. She rose and rose again, spring petals falling like snow, like confetti, like the globe shaken and shaken until all falls upward afloat. She pressed bare feet into dirt, into sand, into damp grass rooted shallow. She pressed her heart onto her chest and waited for a response. And with each morning earlier light and each night stretching out into something else, connecting breath to page to heavy cloud. Because dawn was still sacred, because this rising had to lead other than here, other than the space that catches in a chest that never fully exhales. Because she was born, because she made planets of her body, hip circles and anchor rolls stumbling into atmospheric dust and other matter, the expanse of sky, the sweetness of oceans calling, planetary draw from this place and insertion back again, calico cries in the tiniest bells inviting home. She circled the house, the block, the prairie dwindling to housing development and decay. She circled daylight calling, more please calling. I can't take you with me. I bind and unbind those lingering hours in burlap rope. I deposit the remainder for some quiet retreat. She circled the very thing she meant to leave, forcing hands through thick water, salinized weight of years and traveling a place that always was and never a place that remains. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Thank you so much. It was beautiful. Oh. And thank you to all of our readers. Oh my gosh, this reading was just like, whoa, it did blow my socks off. They're not on my feet anymore. <laughs> Um, thank you very much. Um, and um, post your applause or unmute or something for everyone as you come up with your burning questions. Um, we still have a couple minutes left. So I would love for if you have a question, please uh, put it in the chat and uh, I can read it aloud. Or if you would like to speak it aloud, you may unmute and do that. I'll give you a second to think.
while other people are thinking, I have to ask what the process of developing an Oracle deck is like, Megan. Um, if there's anything that you want to say about about how you how you come up with the relationship between image and text, um, or anything that just comes up, it I I think it would be fascinating to hear. Sure. I mean, I when I moved to Kansas, I I had not been here before. Um, and I really wanted to get to know this place and learn how to live here. And it was my first academic job too. So it, it's kind of disorienting. Um, and I, I don't know, I'm someone who always spent time outside as a kid. And I just started going out to the prairie and walking and paying attention to the plants and learning about them and listening to them. So um, it, the, the project grew out of that. I have, um, I studied with Shani Nicholas, um, like, I don't know, I guess once I, a little after I started moving here, before she was like really famous, and <laughs> I feel like everyone studies with Shani Nicholas. Um, but um, so I learned about astrology from her and then it just kind of evolved into this. But yeah, I, I just try to listen to the plants. And you too can listen to the plants at Megan's workshop. <laughs> How's that for a pitch? Y'all can also ask each other questions too. I don't want to hog the mic by asking everything. I have more. <laughs> I'll pop in with a question. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, this question's just for Angela. I was so struck by the voice of the protagonist. And I don't know, I just felt like even though I didn't even, you know, we, we popped into the middle of the story and in, in, in this beautiful moment, I felt like I could picture that girl and her grandmother and, you know, your voice went to a place and I'm just wondering about the process of you writing her. What was that experience like for that? How did you come to the voice? Does that make sense? It absolutely does make sense. And thank you. Full disclosure, Sequoia is a friend as, as well. So it's, it's exciting to see her here. Um, I'm a very character driven writer. So I spend probably uh, several months just getting to know the, the characters before I act, actually sit down to write the story. So um, I remember when I was, I was listening to Toni Morrison talk about her writing process years ago. And she talked about the struggles being a teacher because when she was teaching, she, it was so hard to, to shift from being a teacher and being a writer. So what she did during her school year was really get to know her characters so that when the summer came, when she didn't teach, she could just sit down and write. And I thought, well, if it's good enough for Toni Morrison, it's good enough for me. But what I, I, but what I got out of it on top of just, I was able to multitask the teaching and the preparing to write was that I ended up knowing a lot more about my characters than I normally did when I would just sit down and start writing chapter one and, and hope for the best. The, this process really allows me to, when I sit down, no matter what circumstances my characters are going through, I know how they would react because I know them that well. So it really is a process of just planning and preparing and get and asking questions and knowing things about him that about them that none of you would ever need to know. Like Opal loves the color orange, that never made it into the book. But I was, so I know she would look at the sunset and be awed by the colors that she sees, including the color orange that appears as the sun goes down. So you know, it's just sitting with them and getting into their spirit to the point where you know them almost as instinctively as you know yourself. Beautiful, thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
I don't know if this is as much of a question. I have a little bit of a question, but a comment. I was just so taken by your uh, your daughter poem, uh, Lisa, and the exploration of mothers and daughters and thinking about stuff. It really resonated for me, thinking about things in my own life. And um, I'm wondering if you could talk about the relationship with your new book. Um, you know, I don't know if it's the daughter of the first book, but, um, you know, thinking about how, how it seems like there are a lot of connections between the poems you read. And I wonder if you'd give us a little bit of a preview of what's going on in your, your forthcoming book. It's so interesting because um, as I, so this is what I read is just a, obviously a, a subset, but um, the way I ordered them, I felt like I used dream in the first three or four poems and that's not necessarily how it how it plays out in the book but it was kind of interesting to me that um that the uh dreams do come up a lot a lot in the book um but it is I mean there's a lot of it's sort of a it, in some ways a continuation of my first book in terms of my obsession with my mother which is um you know obsessions a lot of writers talk about obsessions as being gifts because it means we have something to write about. So that writing about my mother's alcoholism is very prominent in this book. And and the daughter poems, that's just one poem, but there's lots of others. Um, I don't know, maybe it sort of emerges from that. Like it's the next step from, you know, writing about my mother and then writing about um, the fact that I'm not a mother, but um, with the imagination, I can have this, um, this sort of entry into that world on the page, which I, I treasure so much to, um, to be able to engage with this imaginary person who, who also feels very real to me. Um, and then of course, it's interesting because my there's a lot of poems in the book about my father and his dementia. And there's so much with dementia that's, you know, you're living in a different world, you're, you're living in the past, you're living in a place that's not real. And so that ties into so much in with the daughter poems and, and also with the questions I have about the, or my relationship with the divine, you know, that sense of something being there and not there, you know, not something you can see, but very much there. And um, it's all kind of, it is all kind of connected. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, I have a question for everyone, I guess, that we, we might be able to approach wrapping up with. Um, for the, the writers among us, um, practical things about publication, I'm really intrigued by something that came up just before this reading started. Um, Angela was talking about the transition from a small press to a large press. Um, and all of you have experience with, with different sizes of presses, different literary journals, et cetera, et cetera. Is there any practical advice that you wanna offer people about um, trying to get their work out there? Any experience that you've had with small or large presses, literary magazines, um, tidbits of wisdom? I just think that would be a nice thing to hear. Well, I'll, I'll start. I, I... The thing that I, I try to um, share with my students is focus on the writing. That, that's the main thing. You know, I, there was nothing that I could have done different than what I did um, that would have, I mean, there's so much that goes into it as far as my agent, the, the way the stars were aligned, the mood that the editor was in at the publishing house when they read my manuscript. You know, there's so many different factors that I, as a writer, have zero control over. But the thing that I do have control over is the writing. So I'm doing everything that I possibly can to elevate my craft, to make sure that I have given my work, whether it's poetry, whether it's short stories or a novel or a play, 
that I've given it everything that I can possibly give to it. And then I just trust the process. And then if, I, if the response is no, I don't take it personal. Um, I, I'll quickly say when I was just first started as a writer, I used to send everything that I wrote to the New Yorker and they kept saying no. And then I sent it again because that's where you're supposed to send your writing. All good writers are published in the New Yorker. Then I realized, girl, you're not writing things that the New Yorker normally publishes. So why don't you redirect your attention to the types of publications that are truly interested in what you write? And that was like a light bulb moment for me. So, you know, instead of trying to force something into a place that it may be not be meant for, don't worry about little presses, mid-sized presses, large presses. Focus on a press that's going to feed your spirit as far as they care about what you do. They want to see it be successful and everything else will work out. Yeah, I just have to second second that the the importance of focusing on the writing is so as Angela said that I mean that's that's where it is. That's the real part of all this and that is the most important part of it. I know for me, writing is really kind of a spiritual practice. Like if I don't, um, that that's that's what's real to me. That's what's so important. And if I don't write, um, you know, something kind of shrivels up inside me. And it it's really it's not about the publishing. I mean, it's great to be published, um, but it's it's about a relationship to that process I I one bit of advice that I got though from uh someone that you know about more of a practical issue is this was someone who won a a, a an award for his poetry magazine I mean for his poetry manuscript through a university press um and he what he said to me was that that experience I mean it was a nice sort of exciting moment when it happened, but that particular, that university press, um, they didn't really, after he was done, you know, with his tour and everything, that was it. There was no long-term relationship. And what he said to me was find a, find a press that, a small press that likes you, that loves your work and that you can have a relationship with. And that's so, that's always stuck with me, um, that that relationship with the press is so key. Uh, I guess I'll just second and third everything that Angela and Lisa said. Um, and just, um, I don't know, I was talking with someone today who's uh, thinking about sending out work and dismayed about being rejected. and. Um, I pointed out that if you're sending work to places you care about, um, even if it gets rejected, it's been read. And it's been read by someone who, oh, <laughs> Brenda the cat wants to, to join too. <laughs> she, um, she's, a, she's a star. So yeah, Brenda says that you you get read if you, you can be read by someone who's um, you care about and that matters a lot, right? Even if you get read by editors and they don't quite take it, um, that's, that's still kind of beautiful. You're still reaching an audience, so. <laughs> Thank you all for saying those things and reminding us um, of the relationship Part. I think that that's just always great to hear. And and thank you, Kat, um, for jumping in as you did. Um, <laughs> does anyone have any final thoughts or questions um, as we wrap up? I want to thank our readers. I want to thank Amy Miller, behind the scenes tech. Um, and uh, for all that you do for LLA, thank you, Amy. Um, and um, we will see you all in the fall. So thanks so much for coming and have a great rest of your night. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everybody.